the ABC seeks to treat Indigenous cultures and beliefs with respect. To many communities, it is distressful and offensive to depict persons who have died. Indigenous communities which may be offended are warned that the following program may contain such scenes. The 1990s saw a march towards Aboriginal reconciliation. The target was 2001, the centenary of Federation. Reconciliation is coming, but the goal is not yet reached. It's an historic moment in the nation where we've reached the crossroads. Australians are fast wanting to move down the path, the path of settling a lot of the unfinished business. Despite the hopes of reconciliation, many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have missed out. They are the most deprived and oppressed citizens. Many still live in conditions that other Australians would not tolerate. Australian history was once said to start in 1788 with the arrival of the white man. But Australians now know they have another history. It arose in the annals of antiquity. It is the story of Aboriginal Australia, one of the oldest of all civilizations. I would say a minimum of 50,000 years. 50,000 years means 2,000 generations, yet it only seven or eight takes us back to 1788, gives you some idea of the time. And the number of people that that might involve on present estimates is anywhere from 400 million to a billion. Aboriginal society, like other indigenous societies, failed to cope with the arrival of Europeans. Boiled down, the policy on Aborigines should have two objects. Firstly, to collect and record the habits, customs, etc. And secondly, to make the path to extinction, which we all agree is inevitable and rapidly approaching, as pleasant as possible. Frank Gillen, Alice Springs Postmaster. One hundred years ago, white Australians did not believe that they would ever have to confront the reality of Aboriginal society. But they were wrong. The question of how Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians live together is our unfinished business. Australia was founded on a series of falsehoods. The first was terra nullius, that this was the land of no one. When the Union Jack was raised at Sydney Cove, the Aborigines in the surrounding bush were assumed to be non-existent. Next came the great European arrogance, the belief that the Aborigine was doomed to extinction. And finally, there was the moral vacuum at the heart of the Australian constitution that the Aborigine had no place or purpose in the democracy being created. A 
Australia had been a nation for 12 weeks. The centre was consumed by drought. On the 19th of March, 1901, an anthropological expedition left Udnadatta to document the Aborigines of Central Australia. Leading the expedition was W. Baldwin Spencer, a scientist imbued with the values of the time. The rapidity with which a tribe undergoes degeneration as soon as it comes in contact with civilization is astonishing. Disease plays havoc with its numbers, old customs are rapidly forsaken, and beliefs that have been firmly held for ages are quietly dropped. Baldwin Spencer's companion, Frank Gillen, was the former post and telegraph master at Alice Springs. It was a path-breaking expedition. They produced the first moving footage of Central Australian Aborigines. There was a native camp out in the scrub containing some 30 or 40 men and women who had come in to perform a rain ceremony. This rain dance gave us the opportunity of experimenting with the cinematograph. The chief difficulty was that the performers every now and then ran off the ground into the surrounding scrub. Baldwin Spencer. Spencer and Gillen traveled with two Aborigines, Elikilaika and Parunda. Their expedition was utterly dependent on these guides who gave them entree into Aboriginal communities. Elikalika acted as a, a very important anthropological interpreter for them. I've been through Spencer's notebook and it's quite clear that he just jotted down literally what uh, uh, he was being told and then he wrote it up for publication. So really it was Elikalika's uh, material that provided uh, a very large chunk of the book that Spencer and Gillen produced as a result of that expedition. The expedition travelled through Alice Springs, whose population numbered a dozen. The Overland Telegraph had brought the pastoral industry. It would be dependent on unpaid Aboriginal labour. This was frontier territory. No arrests were made before the late 1880s. The only things that have hitherto proved of any value in bringing the niggers to their senses have been dogs and revolvers. Northern Territory Times and Gazette, 17th of July, 1875. Spencer and Gillen deplored such attitudes. Gillen had mastered two dialects of Aranta and was regarded as an initiated member of the Aranta tribe. All pastoral leases should contain a clause reserving to the blacks right of access to all parts of the lease. Once the pastoral lessee is given to understand that he must not restrict the movements of the blacks under heavy penalties, he will soon come to regard himself and the blacks as joint occupiers, both having equal rights. Frank Gillen. Despite their sympathies, Spencer and Gillen both concluded that the Aborigines faced extinction. In contact with the white man, the Aborigine is doomed to disappear. In a very few years, the race will be extinct over a wide area. The Aborigines were given no place in the Australian Constitution of 1901. But the first Commonwealth Parliament would go even further. In 1902, government Senate leader and future High Court judge Richard O'Connor presented the Commonwealth Franchise Bill to the Senate. It was a landmark 
The vote was being given to women and to Aborigines. I think we might treat the position of Aboriginals under our electoral laws not only fairly, but with some generosity. At the time, Aborigines had limited voting rights in four states and were denied the vote in Queensland and Western Australia. Many West Australians objected to the bill. Their spokesman was Senator Alexander Matheson, an English aristocrat and businessman who migrated to the West in 1894. We must take some steps to prevent any Aboriginal from acquiring the right to vote. Surely it is absolutely repugnant to the greater number of the people of the Commonwealth that an Aboriginal man or Aboriginal lubra or gin, a horrible, degraded, dirty creature, should have the same rights that we have decided to give our wives and daughters. Yeah, yeah. Matheson moved an amendment which would deny to most Aborigines the right to vote at federal elections. O'Connor rejected it. It would be a monstrous thing to treat the Aboriginals whose land we were occupying in such a manner as to deprive them absolutely of any right to vote in their own country. Surely we are not going to apply this doctrine with a savagery which is quite unworthy of the beginnings of this federation. Matheson's amendment was defeated. The bill now went to the House of Representatives for debate. It was shameful and short. Labour leader Chris Watson feared that giving the vote to Aborigines would disadvantage the Labour Party. In Western Australia, where Aboriginals are very largely indentured to squatters, they would not dare to attempt to exercise their votes in defiance of the wishes of their masters. Uncivilised blacks could in sufficient numbers be brought in to turn the tide at an election. <laughs> Watson was followed by the Victorian pro-Labour independent H.B. Higgins later hailed as the father of arbitration and a great social reformer. He now moved an amendment to deny Aborigines the vote. It is utterly inappropriate to grant the franchise to the Aborigines or ask them to exercise an intelligent vote. The Barton government accepted the Higgins amendment and it was carried in both houses. Women had won the vote at federal elections. They were triumphant. Most of the women can scarcely yet realize that it is true. And when they do realize it, the country will ring with a mighty yes! But Aborigines have been denied their rights. For the next 60 years, most Aborigines would not vote at federal elections. In 1911, the federal government assumed responsibility for the Northern Territory. A year later, the pioneering anthropologist Baldwin Spencer arrived in Darwin. As chief protector, his job was to advise the government on how to administer the territory's 22,000 Aborigines. He recommended large-scale reserves to preserve tribal Aboriginal life. Baldwin Spencer was alarmed at the plight of Aborigines living in towns. He said they had lost their traditions, become degenerate, and many of their children were part Aboriginal. No half-caste children should be allowed to remain in any native camp, but they should all be withdrawn and placed on stations. So far as practicable, this plan is now being adopted. He recommended that their children be taken away and educated in the European way. So he was propagating the concept of the stolen generation. It became federal government practice to separate part Aboriginal children from Aboriginal society. The justification in law was the best interests of the child. Family consent was not needed. 
No doubt the mothers would object. And there would probably be an outcry from well-meaning people about depriving the mother of her child. But the future of the children should, I think, outweigh all other considerations. Acting Administrator, Northern Territory. The bungalow was established in Alice Springs in 1914 to house the children. The Administrator of the Northern Territory was proud of this initiative. These half-caste, quadroon and octoroon children have been brought together and are now accommodated in a building erected under the supervision of Senior Constable Stott, protector of Aboriginals. The erection of the building has cost only £25. Northern Territory Administrator. It consisted of three corrugated iron sheds. Each child received one blanket a year and instruction from the matron and teacher, Ida Stanley. Dear sir, it affords me great pleasure to forward you some specimens of work done by half-caste children at Alice Springs. The little half-castes have possibilities of a future. In the 1930s, the head dormitory girl was Hetty Perkins, whose tenth child would become the first Aboriginal University graduate and Commonwealth Department head. The dormitories were pretty tough to live in. Uh, everybody slept in rows, like in a prison, and the food was all served up in a very harsh manner, as though you're all in prison, and you ate what you had in front of you, and you don't ask for anything more. And my mother was, you know, uh, trying to sort of keep everybody organised and keep the morale up and everything. And uh, so it was pretty tough going for all of us. The bungalow remained for another 40 years, a symbol of the policy of separating part Aboriginal children. In the late 1920s, Alice Springs was still a frontier town. Mounted Constable William George Murray was the local policeman. A first-rate shot and a light horse veteran from Gallipoli, Murray thrived in the outback. In the case of blacks found simply to be cheeky, the more effective deterrent was summary punishment. For the minor offences, blows with a stick or the fist were enough. With the more aggressive, the lesson was better demonstrated by tying the black to a tree and flogging him with a hobble chain. In August 1928, a dingo trapper, Fred Brooks, was murdered by local Walpuri Aborigines, 22 kilometres from Coniston Station. a search party to track down the Aborigines responsible. It covered more than 1,200 kilometres and became the last of the punitive expeditions against the Aborigine. Murray later admitted that his expedition had killed 31 Aborigines, including two women. In each case, the natives resisted violently. I beat them off and killed two with their own weapons. As the position appeared too serious, I called on my assistants to fire. Unfortunately, a number of natives were killed. Jim died that. Nagadman, Alagold, and my old gentleman, Jerome Babel, and Jim died that. Nagadman, Alagold, and 
the old woman, the one got him from Virgin, try camp again. The one ballon, Penijem, Adam and Penijem, Homan, Kate, and big boy, the one Penijem holds again. Penim, no one will get away. No one, nothing hold Penijem. Murray arrested two Aborigines for killing Brooks. At trial, they were found not guilty. A lay missionary, Annie Locke, reported that the Walpri believed their casualties to be far higher. The natives tell me that they simply shot them down like dogs. That they caught the little children and hit them on the back of the neck and killed them. They all say the same thing. And instead of 31, it was over 70. Prime Minister Stanley Bruce was forced to hold an official inquiry. It concluded that the shooting was justified and that there was no evidence of a massacre. Each of the witnesses emphatically stated that the shooting was absolutely necessary to save their own lives. It was a whitewash. Murray was cleared. <coughs> For the Walpree people, the killings resulted in a retreat from their traditional country. later, Justice Tui accepted the claim of the Walpuri people to these lands under land rights law. The legacy of the killings became part of the Walpuri story. But the people are people not going to come and learn what they are going to get here, you know. 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 They are going to get here. All the brown. Yeah. By the 1930s, the Aborigines had triumphed over the European belief that they would die out. Despite poverty, disease, and rejection, the Aboriginal people had survived to become the object of scientific inquiry. of removing part Aboriginals from their own communities continued. If left in the camps, the half-caste is reared as an Aboriginal. Under such conditions, the half-caste is an outcast. Not wanted either by the Aboriginals or the whites. J.A. Perkins, Minister for the Interior. In April 1937, Commonwealth and state officials had their first meeting to formulate a national policy. The destiny of the natives of Aboriginal origin, but not of the full blood, lies in their ultimate absorption by the people of the Commonwealth, and it is therefore recommended that all efforts be directed to that end. Aboriginal Welfare Conference, Canberra. Assimilation was enshrined. Now, I should like to sing for you my mother's favorite song. Let others make a garden of every flower that blows, but I will wait till I may pluck my dainty English rose. Part Aboriginals were to be educated to white standard and absorbed into white society as equals. It was assumed that full-blood Aborigines would either be assimilated over a longer period or remain in tribal society. What it really meant was making blackfellas into white people. You weren't encouraged to think with any pride about being an Aboriginal. You were encouraged to think that you were part of a dying race 
and that you were encouraged to think that the only way to achieve anything was to uh, intermarry with the non-Aboriginal person. Assimilation was official policy for several decades. Its assumption was that raising Aborigines as whites was doing them a great favour. It meant lifting educational, health and economic standards. It also meant removing children, mainly part Aboriginal children from Aboriginal communities. This was enshrined in law and the pain of family separation was justified as being in the child's best interests. Assimilation would continue into the 1950s under its greatest exponent, Paul Hasluck. A West Australian Liberal, Hasluck became Minister for Territories in 1951 in the Menzies government. He was a harsh critic of past policy. We should cease treating them as subnormal people and regard them in the same way as all other Australians. Hasluck supported the removal of part Aboriginal children where necessary, but gave more weight to the mother's consent. I do not want a hard and fast rule. The test to be applied is simply what action is likely to be conducive to a happy future life for the child. The Menzies government adopted the philosophy of cultural Darwinism. Aborigines had survived, but their culture would die. Assimilation is the object of native welfare measures. This means, in practical terms, that in the course of time it is expected that all those persons of Aboriginal blood or mixed blood will live like white Australians do. Paul Hasluck, Minister for Territories. If Aborigines were to be like whites, then they must have the vote. After 60 years of denial, the Menzies government finally gave Aborigines voting rights in 1962. But discrimination was still rife. It was very strong, particularly the country towns. If you went into a dress shop, if you're a woman, well, you just don't try the dress on. Uh, and if you, you, if, you, if you did try it on, you, you buy it, regardless of fitted or not. In a delicatessen or, uh, you know, milk bar or whatever, or a restaurant, if a white person came in, you've got to give up your seat. If they haven't got a seat, you stand back. By the mid-1960s, Aboriginal leaders, the Labour Party and university students were demanding an end to discrimination. The white person in Australia must be educated to be able to understand the Aboriginal person, to be more tolerant towards him. In 1965, Prime Minister Robert Menzies met Aboriginal leaders. A new demand was being made a referendum to address the plight of Aboriginal Australians. Faith Bandler was one of the main activists. He had no idea that there was such suffering in this country that he was governing. No idea whatsoever. He listened very carefully and then later he uh, said, well, come and have some tea in the ante room. And he started off by um, offering drinks. And he said to Ujuru, who was then Kath Walker, the poet, and whose work he had read, uh, what will you drink? And she said, well, Prime Minister, if you lived in Queensland and you offered me a drink, you'd be put in jail. And he hesitated, and I could see, we could all see, he was quite shocked, this woman who had created these beautiful poems that he'd read, was deprived of having a drink. Totally illegal in the state she came from. And I remember very clearly, he threw his head in the air and said, well, I'm the boss around here. And she had some alcohol with us. But Menzies was not converted. He rejected the main request from the Aboriginal leaders to allow the Commonwealth to make laws for Aborigines.
It was only after Menzies retired in 1966 and Harold Holt became Prime Minister that the referendum was put. It proposed two things. Aborigines would be included in the census and it gave the Commonwealth joint responsibility for Aborigines with the states. The referendum is on Saturday and it's important that we should have the maximum vote because the eyes of the world are on Australia. They are waiting to see whether or not the white Australian will take with him as one people the dark Australian. Vote yes for Aborigines, they want to be Australians too. Vote yes to give them rights and freedoms just like me and you. Vote yes for Aborigines. It was the 27th of May, 1967. There has never been a referendum like it. 1967 referendum was seen to be such a simple proposition that no negative case was even formulated by the parliament to be put to the Australian people. It was put almost as a self-evident proposition. Why wouldn't you allow the Commonwealth Parliament to make laws about Aborigines as you would allow them to make laws about anybody else. Support was overwhelming. Good evening. The result of the referendum on the Aboriginal question was a resounding triumph for the Aboriginal cause. Australia recorded a yes vote of nearly 91%. When the results came out, you know, everybody was so uh, happy about it and uh, just couldn't believe the, the results. And we thought, well, this is definitely going to be a watershed in race relations in the country. The referendum opened the way for a new approach, Commonwealth funds and programs for Aborigines. But Harold Holt did not see the vote as a mandate for action. Three months later, the cabinet decided that the Commonwealth should not be seeking to take a large-scale initiative either on policy or administration. A small office of Aboriginal Affairs was established under Dr. H.C. Coombs. Coombs would be bitterly disappointed in the Liberal governments of John Gorton and Sir William McMahon. I think uh, the real tragedy of the Aboriginal people is that we have uh, destroyed their, the basis of their traditional life in large respect. And they have become dependent uh, in a sense almost of being objects of charity and therefore in a sense objects of contempt to, uh, uh, to white people. At the same time, even the people who seek have sought to help them have almost invariably uh, sought to help them in a way which almost increased that dependence. I think, if anything, the 67 referendum was good for what it sought to do, but it was a double-edged sword. What it also did was it, it cemented firmly this idea in the Indigenous mind that not only was there an entitlement to welfare benefits, but we ended up becoming the victims of only a welfare economy and no other opportunities being provided. The 1967 referendum is a deeply misunderstood event. It wasn't about citizenship or land rights or some grand future agenda. It was about treating Aborigines as though they were Australians. It was about equality, and that's why the vote was so high. Many people saw the referendum as the end of the process. In truth, it was just the start. It launched a log of Aboriginal demands that would run for decades and provoke a backlash. In the Northern Territory, Aborigines were making a new claim, land rights. They wanted justice, not just equality. They would force Australians to confront the issue of dispossession. These Aboriginal stockmen are on strike. They walked off the job over a month ago. Their wives, children and relatives went with them. <coughs> this is the Wave Hill mob. Wave Hill was the biggest pastoral station in the Northern Territory, owned by the British company, the Vesti Corporation. 
The Gurindji were demanding equal pay. But this industrial campaign quickly led to a political demand. The Gurindji wanted ownership of their land. Their campaign was led by Vincent Lingiari, the head stockman. And Mr. Morris come along. He said, hey, you steal another man country. <laughs> oh, yes. <coughs> That's all right. <coughs> and I said, no, well, what was before the bestie born and I born? That was a black fellow country. But Liberal Prime Minister John Gorton was not interested in Aboriginal land rights. His Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, W.C. Wentworth, proposed that eight of the 6,000 square miles at Wave Hill be given to the Gurindji. There was an outcry from Territory pastoralists, and the Gorton government said no. There were suggestions that uh, the federal government should act. But quite frankly, the country party resisted and they gave in to that country party resistance. Labour leader Gough Whitlam accepted the moral case for land rights. He promised land rights at the 1972 election. Whitlam repudiated assimilation and said the world would judge Australia by its treatment of the Aborigines. If there is one ambition my government places above all others, it is this, that the government I lead removed a stain from our national honour and brought back justice and equality to our Aboriginal people. Whitlam arranged for the besties to offer a substantial lease to the Gurindji. You remember Lingiari, their spokesman? And Nugget Coombs advised me to reverse the procedure which had happened in Victoria with Batman. Batman, in about 1830s, had got the Aborigines to pour some earth into his hands as a livery of season, the old Norman term. And Nugget Coombs said, what about doing that with Lingiari? So I bent down, picked up some sand, and poured it into his hands as a token that this land was now his tribe's land. I solemnly hand to you these deeds as proof in Australian law that these lands belong to the Yurindji people. important demand for land rights came from the people of Yurikala. They had gone to court claiming rights over land being mined for bauxite by Nabalco at Gove. For the first time in 1971, we had the spectre of Aboriginal Australian citizens going to a court and claiming that they had rights to land, claiming that in the eyes of the British common law, they had rights to land which pre-existed the assertion of sovereignty by the British Crown. This was the first test case over terra nullius. The judge upheld the accepted law that Aboriginal interests were extinguished by British sovereignty. Gough Whitlam stepped into the breach. He asked Justice Woodward to report on how to introduce land rights in the Northern Territory. A government, a national government, was prepared to look at how land might be returned to the Aboriginal people. That was a transforming sentiment in this country for Aboriginal people. Whitlam was determined to use the Northern Territory as the vanguard for land rights. The states had no power in the Territory. The bill was introduced in 1975, but Whitlam was dismissed before it became law. In a major break from the previous coalition government, new Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser introduced and passed a modified law. The coalition had run out of steam in 1972 and Mr Whitlam came to power. 
with a very different kind of government. Now, all of that having happened, I believe that it would have been quite wrong to say, no, we're going to throw all this aside. We're going to ignore this. We're going to go back to the attitudes that had prevailed on earlier times. But by the 1980s, the backlash had come. Through Aboriginal land claims, your right of access to up to 50% of Western Australia could be taken away. Support for Aboriginal rights was starting to fracture. The Hawke government retreated from its promise to implement national land rights. It was a difficult decision. It was taken in the context that um, there was not yet, I thought, at that, at that stage, uh, a sufficient education and understanding on the part of some electorates, particularly in Western Australia. In June 1988, following pressure for a treaty, Hawke went to Barunga in the Northern Territory. He was presented with a series of demands in the Barunga Statement. There shall be a treaty negotiated between between the Aboriginal people and the government on behalf of all the people of Australia. But the treaty never materialised. Middle Australia was turning against the Aboriginal political agenda. A dangerous gulf was opening up in Australia. Black and white Australia, together, in harmony, is what we've always said could happen. Hawke's solution was to buy time and try to establish a new consensus. The result was a 10-year reconciliation process supported by both sides of politics. In 1991, when the Council, uh, the Act was passed, we'd just finished the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths and Custody, and there are some 339 recommendations to deal with underlying issues. Uh, but also a significant uh, amount in the reports were about reconciliation. So there was a fairly high expectation, I think, that we might address the underlying issues. The aim was to have reconciliation by 2001. But there was a dramatic intervention, this time by the High Court. I have an overwhelming conviction that Mabo was right and that no self-respecting court uh, could come to a conclusion other than the conclusion reached in Mabo. On the 3rd of June, 1992, the High Court of Australia brought down a landmark decision. The case originated with the Murray Islander, Eddie Koiki Mabo. The judgment overturned the doctrine of terra nullius, that the land belonged to no one in 1788. Our previous approach to the position of the indigenous inhabitants of this country was based on a fiction, uh, namely that they did not own the land, that the land did not belong to them. It uh, spelled out that terra nullius was a lie and we have lived by that lie for a number of years in this country, and it's done some damage, some horrendous damage to Aboriginal people. Of course this was not the land of no one. It could never have been terra nullius. This just is, is historically wrong. Therefore, if it was the land of someone, that someone, their customs and traditions were as much a source of the common law as European custom and tradition had been informing the body of Australian common law. And in that law, there's a title. It's called native title. Paul Keating was now prime minister. He seized the Mabo judgment as a truth and the basis for a new relationship between indigenous and non-indigenous Australians. There is no more basic... At Redfern in December 1992, he called for an act of recognition. Marbo is an historic decision. We can make it an historic 
turning point, the basis of a new relationship between Indigenous and non-Aboriginal Australians. I said there that it had to be about an act of recognition, that we were the ones that did the dispossessing, we're the ones that brought the diseases, the alcohol, we're the ones that did the murders, we're the ones who took the children, and either we did or we didn't. And if we did, where should the act of recognition begin? It should begin with the Prime Minister. Prime Minister. Kevin, I move the amendments be agreed to. There was a furious battle. The Keating government proposed a native title act for Aboriginal land claims. The coalition rejected the bill outright. This is a day of shame for Australia. A day of shame for Australia. Lock the doors. It was the longest debate on a bill in the Senate's history. At midnight on the 21st of December 1993, the Labour government, with the support of the minor parties, passed an historic law. There being 34 ayes and 30 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. It allowed Aborigines to claim native title where nobody else had an interest in the land and where they had a traditional association. And so in 1993, the Australian nation was entertained to the spectre where even a powerful Prime Minister did not hold all the Trump cards, and the state governments didn't hold all the Trump cards, and the mining and pastoral industries didn't hold all the Trump cards. Aborigines were there with some Trump cards saying, we can walk away any time because our common law rights are protected by the High Court and buttressed by the Racial Discrimination Act. And you, the Commonwealth Parliament, won't dare take away the Racial Discrimination Act. So really, we have something to negotiate about. Before Mabo, land rights were given by Parliament as an act of generosity. Mabo changed this. It said that Aborigines had rights by virtue of their ownership of the land before 1788. Only the High Court could have imposed this solution. Only the High Court could have broken the 1980s political deadlock over land rights, the moral and the legal foundations of the relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians were rewritten by the court. But the High Court was not finished. In December 1996, in a 4-3 decision, the court strengthened native title rights in its weak judgment. It found that native title could coexist with a pastoral lease. John Howard's government was stunned. Having read the Marbo decision, it seemed to me to make a lot of sense. I thought we had a, a line and then Wick came along and seemed to, uh, I think, um, blur that. I think it was very unfortunate that we had to go through the, all the problem over the status of pastoral leases. I think that caused quite a, a negative reaction in rural Australia. We're here because four judges of the High Court of Australia, not seven, four out of the seven, made a judgment which must go down in history as the most impractical and unworkable judgment ever produced by the High Court of Australia. The non-Labour Premiers and the pastoralists demanded that the Howard government extinguish native title rights. But Howard knew this wouldn't work. He wanted a compromise. The result was a new law which kept but weakened native title. The, the whole issue of native title has not only changed the political landscape, I think if anything it is still sitting out there as a matter of unfinished business as well. Leone is different, not only because she's an Aborigine, but because she's an Aborigine with white parents. She was there was another unfinished issue, the removal of Aboriginal children a practice which had continued throughout the century. In April 1997, the Bringing Them Home inquiry 
produced a powerful oral history of grief and loss. This is a terrible record. A terrible, terrible record. The report this called for all real. Australian parliaments to apologise and for compensation. The experience of Each state parliament made an apology, times. but the Commonwealth Parliament expressed regret. Well, my position in relation to the apology is very simply the fact that I don't believe in apologising for something for which I was not personally responsible. It's as simple as that. I mean, I was brought up as a, as a child by my parents to say sorry when I was to blame. After a 10-year process, reconciliation was only partly realised. In May 2000, the Reconciliation Declaration was carried into Sydney's Opera House and presented to Australia's political leaders. One part of the nation apologises and expresses its sorrow and sincere regret for the injustices of the past. So the... So the other part accepts the apologies and forgives. The apology is important because it is about a gesture of atonement, but much more about acknowledging the past. If reconciliation is about truth and about the stories being able to come to the surface and people to acknowledge those, it's not a case of picking and choosing what people will accept and sanitise the rest of history and reject what they won't accept. Apology cannot disguise the legacy of two centuries. Aborigines are the poorest in a rich society, the most unhealthy in a healthy society, the least educated in an educated society. Unemployment is four times the national average. Imprisonment is 12 times. Life expectancy for an Aboriginal man is only 57 years and 62 years for a woman. Despite land rights and spending programs, Indigenous Australians have not found the path to economic self-sufficiency. Our relegation to the dependence on perpetual passive income transfers meant that our people's experience of the welfare state has been negative. Indeed, in the final analysis, completely destructive and tragic. It's absolutely essential that we've got to break this uh, welfare dependency and that cycle of being on the treadmill that leads us back to welfare. What we've now got to put back in place is the glue that binds the family together. And self-esteem in the context of culture is vitally important. A younger generation of Aboriginal leaders talk a new language, responsibility as well as rights. Aboriginal Australians now look to both the past and the future, a past of oppression and a future that cannot reside in a victim mentality. I think Aboriginal people were too passive. I think we just went along with a lot of the initiatives by state and federal governments, by politicians, by well-meaning people, and we should have uh, been a bit more aggressive, perhaps violent, perhaps more militaristic, perhaps more confrontationalist, who knows? I think we've got to forgive. I certainly have forgiven those who kidnapped my father. I haven't forgotten, and I don't think we should forget. I don't see how we can plan the future if we forget the past. But it's vital to forgive. 
Australia has to reach a closure on its past. That's what reconciliation means. It's about putting the past behind, saying sorry and forgiving. Most Aboriginals will find their future in the mainstream Australian economy. There's a new message from Aboriginal leaders. The need, not just for cultural pride, but economic empowerment. This has been our great failure. These ideas, cultural pride and economic empowerment, are the keys to confronting our unfinished business. In a moment, a look at 100 years for next week. You can find the video and book from the series at ABC shops and centres. The examination of our history continues on radio with 100 Years, the Australian story, heard Sunday afternoons at 2 o'clock on Radio National. And for more details, visit the website via ABC Online. Just go to abc.net.au slash 100 years. Stay with us now for Foreign Correspondent.